Hello, this is your second and last lecture on the judiciary, and then we'll move on to the executive branch in a couple of days. Um, so this um, lecture is about the life tenure and judicial appointment process, as well as uh, an analyzation of some of the different courts. Um, so the first assignment that I'd like for you to do here is reference back to the Federalist 78 that you read earlier and make a pros and cons list. I need three pros and three cons of allowing judges to serve life terms. Um, it's still very controversial today. What life terms mean for the Supreme Court is that it has arguably more power than other branches, um, especially since life expectancy is longer these days. So it's something to think about. But the appointment process. Um, I'm going to attach the resume of Elena Kagan just so you can see um, kind of her background, and it's a good indicator of, of the accomplishments that Supreme Court justices are just expected to have. It's, it's just, it's really impressive. So just glance through it. It's, it's insane. Um, so the president has to compile a list of possible candidates. There's a lot to consider. There's also senatorial courtesy, right? You have to try to pick someone that you think that the Senate will approve. Last year, when Barack Obama was trying to fill the seat um, that Scalia left when he died, um, he didn't nominate a very liberal judge because he knew that it would probably be blocked by the Republicans. So he um, nominated Merrick Garland, who um, is the judge who presided over the terrorist case of the Oklahoma City bombings in the 90s. Um, he's well-loved in conservative and liberal circles, but especially moderate in conservative circles. Um, and I think that he was hoping that he would be able to get that Supreme Court justice through um, Congress. Of course, they, they wouldn't even give him a, a hearing or anything like that. So um, they also have to look into their background, do a background check. They have to have interviews with the president, his staff, all of his cabinet members. When all that's done, you're nominated. Woo! Um, but then you have to go to a Judiciary Committee hearing. Um, nominees are asked to submit biological and financial information to make sure that they don't have any conflicts of interest. Um, they have to submit a list of their past speeches, articles, case rulings, written responses um, to questions posed by committee members. A lot of this will be in the um, thing that I'll upload about Elena Kagan. Um, a lot of that comes from uh, the information that she submitted to the Judiciary committee in Congress. Since 1955, all nominees have attended their hearings, but I guess it used to not be required for some reason. Um, and then there's testimony from their colleagues and professional organizations that they belong to usually. Um, after the hearing, committee members vote on whether or not to recommend the candidate for confirmation and then the Senate will vote on it. It's This committee, though, is not like a normal committee. Um, no matter what the Judiciary Committee decides it will go to a full floor, full vote on the floor. Um, so because the president has nominated this person, it, it, it'll go to, to a vote usually. Um, it's different from other committees that can kill bills if they don't want it passed. You just need a simple majority to pass um, a nominee. This is the second assignment that I would like for you to do. Analyze this um, political cartoon that's from a 2002 AP test described the importance of the power of the president based on the Supreme Court cartoon. And then this is the third assignment that I'd like for you to do. I don't want you to write an FRQ, but I do want you to analyze this chart um, and then um, plan an FRQ. So just kind of bullet points, not full sentences. How would you answer these questions? Um, this will probably show up on your test. Okay, um, so the court is not a policy-making body. Technically, they have no power to enforce their decisions. That's why when the Supreme Court, um, in the Georgia case back in the 1800s, ruled that um, Andrew Jackson had no right to break a treaty with the Native Americans and force them all to move out west, they couldn't actually do anything about it when he ignored them and made them all move out west. So uh, they don't actually enforce things. It's the president. Judicial implementation, though, is how and whether court decisions are translated into actual policy, thereby affecting the behavior of others. So it is usually Congress or the president that have to 
or states that have to enforce these things. Um, it's, you know, it's, Andrew Jackson was able to get away with ignoring the Supreme Court, partially because, you know, it was the 1800s, and ultimately what he was doing was a very popular populist thing, unfortunately. So no one was going to argue with it. But I think these days people are more educated and more aware of, like, what the Supreme Court is actually supposed to do. So I think it would be harder for a president to pull an Andrew Jackson these days. Um, <clears throat> as is evidenced by the, the ban that the circuit courts overturned last month. Um, the Supreme Court uh, interprets, the popu the, interprets the population. Um, the implementing population are the people who need to carry out the decision. They could be in disagreement, like with the Andrew Jackson example. Then there's the consumer population, the people who are affected by the decision. <laughs> All right, so we've gone over judicial restraint and judicial activism, but just to review them, judicial restraint is the idea that judges should play a minimal role in policy making. Um, judicial activism is the idea that judges should be bold in policy decisions and chart new constitutional grounds to help um, right historical wrongs. A lot of the um, activism really got popular in the 50s and 60s. Um, so different types of courts. Uh, throughout the years, we've had several very famous courts that have um, produced a lot of landmark legislation. Um, so we'll start with Marshall. He's the first Supreme Court justice, and he has several important Supreme Court cases under his belt. So we call it the Mar Marshall Court, Court because John Marshall was the chief justice at the time. Murray versus Madison is his first major case to come out of his court. Um, it's the judicial review case. It's a significant expansion of the power of the Supreme Court. Um, he also did, Mar not Murray versus Madison, he did McCulloch versus Maryland as well, and Gibbons versus Ogden. Uh, there's the Nine Old Men Court, <laughs> which was led by Chief Justice Charles E. Hughes. Um, they blocked a lot of pieces of the New Deal legislation. They helped block FDR's court, um, packing plan. And they're also known for the Schechter Poultry Court versus the U.S. and the U.S. versus Butler cases. But I think... These nine old, the Nine Old Men Court is mostly known for just blocking FDR. Then there's the Warren Court, headed by Chief Justice Earl Warren. Uh, this is when the Supreme Court started to become really activist in expanding civil rights and liberties. Um, some of their decisions are um, Brown v. Board, Loving v. Virginia, Westbury v. Sanders, Gideon v. Wainwright, among others. And then there's the Burger Court. Um, that's around in like the 70s. This is under Chief Justice Warren Burger. There's a movement towards a more conservative court, but not that much more conservative than it was in the 50s and 60s. Some of their key decisions include Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education, which said that it's fine to enforce of school desegregation through busing. And yes, that is Charlotte of North Carolina. Uh, Roe v. Wade happened under this court. Furman versus Georgia and Gregg versus Georgia, two Supreme Court cases based on the legality of the death penalty, and the U.S. versus Nixon all happened in the Burger Court. Again, it was supposed to be a more conservative court. There are pretty conservative people on this court, but a lot of their key decisions weren't necessarily that conservative. Uh, then there's the Rehnquist Court. Uh, that was had by Chief Justice William Rehnquist. Um, it's an even more conservative court than the Burger Court. A lot of it is because the Reagan appoints a lot of Supreme Court justices in the 80s. Um, however, they are limited by previous liberal decisions. Uh, Stereodesis, uh, which I'm, again, probably pronouncing wrong. My Latin is not great. That means let the decision stand. That means that they're showing respect for the precedents set by the former courts. So it's not like when a conservative court comes in, they just overturn all of the liberal things that have ever happened like Roe v. Wade or school desegregation um, because the Supreme Court has already ruled on those things. So it's it's difficult to get even a conservative court to just do a mass overhaul of, of things like that. Some of the decisions that came out of the Rehnquist Court, Bush v. Gore, the U.S. v. Lopez, Planned Parenthood Bush v. Casey, which, by the way, is the one that says that the federal government can't fund, um, they can't use federal funds for, for abortions. Then there's the Roberts Court, which is where we are now, um, under Chief Justice Roberts. Major cases that they've heard so far, Gonzalez versus Carhartt, which we'll go over later. 
Ledbetter versus Goodyear. Um, that's one about equal pay for women. Citizens United and McCutcheon versus the FEC are two similar cases um, that we've gone over. Hollingsworth versus Perry, the U.S. versus Windsor, we'll go over later. Um, U.S. versus Windsor is the um, Second Amendment case that they heard recently. So there's a good mix of kind of liberal act and activist things and, and more conservative or restrainist things under the, the Roberts court. So it's hard to say how they'll be remembered, but they are the Citizens United court, so it's probably going to follow them. All right. Um, so Congress and Supreme Court decisions. Congress cannot change a Supreme Court decision directly. However, they do have the amendment power. Um, if something is made an amendment, the Supreme Court has to take that into account, uh, obviously. <laughs> um, had the federal Congress managed to pass a, an amendment barring same-sex marriage, for example, then the Supreme Court would have never been able to have said that, you know, it's unconstitutional to bar um, LGBT couples from, from marriage. The Supreme Court interprets the Constitution. However, again, Congress can change it. All right, that is all for now. I will see you all tomorrow. Have a good afternoon.